all know, one week ago, President Putin invaded Ukraine, a democratic and sovereign country. Thousands have lost their lives, including many civilians. In real time, we've watched in horror as Russian forces commit acts of terror on a peaceful nation who seek nothing more than the right to choose their own future. After World War II, an unprovoked attack in Europe of this magnitude was unthinkable. Tragically, the free world has been dealt a wake-up call. But the bravery, courage, and resolve of the Ukrainian people and its leaders have been incredibly inspiring. Even though they're militarily outmatched, they fought back and united much of the world behind their fight for freedom and reminded us why our democracy must be protected and not taken for granted. I applaud President Biden and our allies for stepping up to support Ukraine by imposing heavy financial pain on Russia. While a military intervention is not currently on the table, we cannot sit idly by while Putin reverses decades of progress since the end of the Second World War. I know there is nothing our small state can do alone in ch to change the outcome of what happens over 4,000 miles away in Ukraine. But I think it's important we do something to show our support for the people of Ukraine in their time of need. So today, I signed an executive order outlining several steps Vermont will take. First, as we announced on Monday, I have directed the Department of Liquor and Lottery to remove Russian-made products from the shelves, stop ordering new stock, and remove Russian-owned brands from special order listings. Second, I'm directing the Secretary of Administration to review all state contracts and immediately cease purchases and terminate contracts for Russian source goods and those produced by Russian entities. We should not support businesses that are funding this horrible war. My office also reached out to the treasurer to see about any investments the state has in Russian enterprises. She informed us that she and her team had already begun looking into it. And given what's happened, as well as the market realities, they will be liquidating any holdings we have. And I'm very grateful to her and her team for their quick action. Next, when the legislature returns next week, I'm asking that they immediately appropriate $643,077, a dollar for every Vermonter to support humanitarian efforts for the, for the people of Ukraine. They can do this in budget adjustment, which is in the final stages of passage. Additionally, in 1990, Vermont entered into a sister state agreement with Karelia. At the time, it was in a part of the Soviet Republic. Today, it's part of Russia. Although the agreement has been dormant for decades, I am rescinding the still active executive order from 1991. This was done at a time when the Cold War was coming to an end, and there was a genuine desire for peace and cooperation. It's clear. Putin's Russia no longer shares this goal and only wants to manipulate other countries in order to attain world power. I also ask municipalities who may have formal relationships with Russian cities to suspend them as well. Finally, the executive order declares that Vermont is ready, willing, and able to accept refugees from Ukraine if need be. Over a million Ukrainians have already been displaced, and we have a moral obligation to do our part. I know several of these steps are symbolic, but we need to let the people of Ukraine know we're there for them. We'll now move to a more familiar topic. We'll hear from Secretary French and Dr. Kelso, who will give updates in light of the new CDC guidance. Dr. Levine is away today 
and the modeling data was posted on the DFR website yesterday. We're encouraged that the trends, especially hospitalizations, continue to move in the right direction. So with that, Dr. Kelso. Thank you, Governor. As you know, we've been working to make gradual changes to COVID-19 guidance as the data continues to reinforce the improving situation with the virus here in Vermont. As we understand this virus is not going away, we need to focus on how we can recover as a state safely. A new map from the CDC released Friday supports our strategy as we've been planning to shift away from being solely focused on case counts to placing greater emphasis on serious outcomes. The CDC's new community levels incorporates new hospital admissions and hospital capacity metrics along with case rates to determine risk. This makes sense as case counts are no longer an accurate measure of transmission with the widespread use of at-home tests. And cases alone no longer have the same impact they once did as the majority of Vermonters are well protected from severe illness through vaccination and more treatment options are available for those at higher risk. In a small state like Vermont, we believe it's most useful to provide public health guidance statewide so it's consistent where we work, live, and go to school. So as our statewide hospitalization rate is low and hospitals are no longer facing the COVID-related strains of the recent surge, we are ready to take the next step. On March 14th, our guidance around masking will be updated and for all Vermonters to reflect the lower risk of severe disease in our communities. Secretary French will speak more about what this means for schools. The decision to wear a mask will be up to each person based on their own circumstances and health needs. As Dr. Levine has already said, we all have different levels of risk and we need to navigate them in our own way at our own pace. We need to remember a person who wears a mask has their own good reasons to do so and respect that. We will also simplify our isolation and quarantine guidance on March 14th. If you test positive, you'll need to stay home and isolate for five days. If you're a close contact and not up to date on your vaccines, you do not need to quarantine but should get tested. If you develop symptoms at any time, you should also get tested. We continue to urge Vermonters to stay up to date on their vaccines and boosters to be as protected as possible. This is key to getting through the pandemic the rest of the way. We'll also continue to conduct surveillance for disease trends, monitor outbreak populations, and be on the watch for new variants. If a new variant emerges that is cause for concern, we'll revisit which includes recommendations on things like masking, isolation, quarantine, testing, and vaccines. While we've learned much about this virus, it does continue to surprise us, and we need to be prepared to adjust if necessary. Finally, I ask Vermonters to make sure you know if you're at higher risk for COVID-19. That way, if you test positive, you'll know to quickly reach out to your healthcare provider and ask about treatment. The list of health conditions that puts you at higher risk continues to be updated, so consult the CDC website or your health care provider if you have questions. And there's more information on the healthvermont.gov website. And now I'll turn it over to Secretary French. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kelso. Good afternoon. Uh, before school winter vacation, uh, we announced the first step in transitioning our schools to a more endemic approach relative to COVID-19 uh, by recommending masks not be required in schools with student vaccination rates of 80% or more. When we made that announcement, we said this would be the first step in an incremental approach, and we wanted to see what the conditions would be like after vacation before deciding on our next steps. We also wanted to give schools enough time after vacation to adjust to any changes in state recommendations. Our goal has been to eliminate separate mitigation recommendations for schools and instead have them follow the broader mitigation recommendations for all Vermonters. 
This idea of eliminating school-specific guidance was endorsed by the Vermont chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and recently, U.S. Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona made a similar recommendation. Specific mitigation recommendations for schools are no longer necessary from a risk perspective. And making this shift will allow us to put a higher priority on addressing the learning and social emotional needs of our students. So starting March 14th, we will not recommend schools follow any additional mitigation requirements other, those, other than those that are being recommended for all Vermonters. This means masks will be optional for all students and staff regardless of vaccination status. And this will apply to school buses as well since masks are no longer required on school buses as a result of a recent change in federal regulation. These changes and state recommendations for schools will go into effect on Monday, March 14th to give schools sufficient time to plan. School districts will still have the option to follow the state recommendations or to adopt their own. We will continue to maintain a separate testing program in schools, including staff assurance testing and our test at home program. Uh, but these programs will be phased out over time uh, in favor of students and staff accessing the testing programs that are available to all Vermonters. That concludes my update. I'll now turn it back over to the governor. Thank you, Secretary French. We'll now open it up to questions. Starting with folks in the room. Governor, it seems like there's a, a sense of, of optimism um, with declining case counts and hospitalizations. But I'm just kind of thinking back to where we were last summer, right? You know, with we, we hit 80% and, and there was reasons to celebrate. After that, we kind of got hit by by back-to-back -back variants, Delta and then Omicron. So I guess from, from your maybe from Dr. Kelso as well, I mean, what is the chance? I'm saying it's, we may see another variant, but what is the chance that we, we have a variant and it kind of sets us back again? Right. Well, a few things. I think uh, one is uh, there will be more variants. That's not, that's not even a question. There's going to be more variants. Um, but we have so many tools in the toolbox now, right? We have all kinds of testing. We have vaccines available, widely spread, um, and we'll be able to, improve. for the most part, uh, the vaccines have been effective against any of the variants that have, been, have come along. So um, we'll have to react accordingly, as we always have, watching the data, the hospitalizations, and so forth, and make determinations based on the information at hand. But we should. We should take advantage of it while we can. Like this, uh, we've seen a dro dramatic drop uh, in uh, hospitalizations uh, over the last two, three weeks, even cases. I mean, think back where we were a month and a half ago. And um, so we're in good shape right now, so we should uh, enjoy life again. Dr. Kelso. I agree with what the governor said. Um, in addition, you know, this is what we experience every year with flu. So year after year, we know that influenza is going to circulate. The reason we need a new flu vaccine every year is because the virus changes all the time. Um, it doesn't always change and become more virulent or causing more severe illness. Sometimes it changes to become milder, and you know, we see really low activity flu seasons sometimes. So I agree we'll probably see more variants. Um, if you ask infectious disease experts, some of them think that um, subsequent variants will not be uh, more virulent because we have so much immunity from natural infection and vaccination in, in our societies, in the US at least. Um, but you know, not everyone's on the same page about that. It's impossible to predict. I think we'll continue to see variants. They won't all be more severe or cause more cases. Governor Scott, Burlington is lifting its mask mandate in public spaces as of today. I'm sure many places will follow suit. What does that sort of say about where we are and how far we've come? And are you happy to start seeing masks come off? Absolutely. I think uh, it's time that we get back to some sort of normal uh, for kids in particular, uh, to see their, their classmates' faces again, their facial expressions, to socially interact uh, and not be in a constant state of fear. So uh, I, think, uh, I think that's all good news. What would you say to parents with children under five who 
still don't have the opportunity to get vaccinated at daycares, say that masks aren't required, say I've heard from some people that are still nervous about that. Yeah, I know there is some level of immunity that's been already built in to those of a younger age. I saw some percentage that was surprising in some respects because the Omicron has been so transmissible. Uh, and so mild that I'm not sure that we even knew that kids had it. So they have built up some immunity at this point. But I might ask Dr. Kelso if she could comment on this. Overall, uh, what we've seen with Omicron and COVID in general since 2019 is that it does not cause severe illness in the vast majority of children um, who are otherwise healthy. So. Um, in discussions I've had with pediatric um, infectious disease healthcare providers, they're not really concerned about that age group, and, and some of them have kids of their own in that age group who are not vaccinated, and they're just not concerned. Um, you know, they think it's um, somewhat likely that some percentage of that age group of kids will get COVID, but they're not really concerned about them having severe illness or you know, them, lots of them ending up in the hospital. Dr. Kelso, um, I was just wondering, is the state already discussing phasing out testing sites, maybe having just a few as opposed to the many we have around the state? What's that? Okay. Um, yeah, we are contemplating, uh, just like vaccination sites as well, uh, is lower demand, and we have a higher percentage of rapid tests available uh, on the shelves and pharmacies and so forth and uh, distributed on a statewide and nationwide basis. I, I know that the uh, President Biden has mentioned as well that these will be distributed on a national basis. So there are all kinds of other opportunities uh, for testing. Um, so there's going to be a natural um, transformation of our, our vaccination centers. Um, Jen, are you on the line at this point? I am on the line, but Governor, I couldn't hear the question and, um, okay. from the speaker. It was about uh, vaccination sites, and are we going to be uh, discontinuing uh, the vaccination sites in the future? Yeah, so uh, we feel really strongly that we've got a well-positioned healthcare system with our primary care providers, with our pharmacies, um, backed up by our Department of Health um, and by our healthcare providers who have been um, providing mass vaccination. I think over the next couple of months, what we will see is an evolution um, where we will see the um, large mass vaccination sites um, become smaller, um, in, particularly in areas where vaccines are available through far, through pharmacies um, pretty, um, <clears throat> pretty widely. Um, and then uh, begin but are prepared if necessary to ramp back up um, if we had a new um, a new uh, vaccine that needed to be distributed. So again, the good thing that Vermont has demonstrated is its capacity to be flexible um, and to ramp vaccinations up um, and down and testing up and down depending on where we are with the virus um, and how we need to respond to the operating environment. Yeah, testing and vaccinations are go hand in hand in uh, many cases. And uh, I think we are transitioning uh, to a new period of time where we shouldn't be testing uh, just for the sake of testing. We should be testing when there's symptoms. Well, you're at the podium. I'm wondering if these positive trends will have um, a positive effect on the state's staffing shortages. Will this maybe help what, we're, what we've been seeing with staffing? I, I wish I could say that this would fix our uh, workforce challenges, um, but uh, but it won't, um, because what we're facing is something that I've talked about over the last five years. Uh, we just don't have enough people. Uh, we are aging out, people are retiring, we have uh, fewer youth, and we have fewer people available uh, to, to satisfy the demands we have, the jobs that are, that are open right now. We just don't have enough people to fill them. So um, this will maybe help in a, some incremental way, but that's not the answer. Uh, we need to bring more people into the state. Governor, and, and probably for Dr. Kelso as well, I just wanted to <clears throat> get back to the discussion around kids in schools. 
and lifting masks there. Um, as you may have seen in Montpelier, there was a group of students that walked out of class yesterday because they were concerned about the lifting of, of the mask mandate, um, primarily because they, they have friends and family members that are immunocompromised. So for um, people that have to share a space with another and they might be immunocompromised themselves, what, what guidance should they be following right yeah, now? Yeah, they should wear masks. If they feel uncomfortable or they want to protect themselves or others, they should wear a mask. Um, and there should be no stigma uh, surrounding that. And we should be accepting of people who want to wear a mask. Uh, but it's not necessary. What we found with masks are uh, they protect others as well as protect themselves, right? So it works both ways. So if, you, uh, if you're in uh, that situation uh, where you're immunocompromised, you should wear a mask. And if you weren't trying to protect someone who's immunocompromised, you should wear a mask. So it's basically a, a decision you make uh, yourself. Uh, when we think about economic recovery from the pandemic, something we've talked about a lot, what do you think this next step signifies on that front? Well, recovery uh, for many is uh, getting more people into the workforce. Uh, and, uh, and, and that was the question that, to take off from what Joe Lee had said. We, uh, we desperately just need more people. We, we, just, we have the jobs available. We have so many openings. It doesn't matter what sector it is. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a, a public or private and state government. We have a lot of opportunities. Uh, but we just don't have the people to fill those positions. So uh, I look at, um, you know, going back pre-pandemic, we had an issue. And, and we've been two years now. And uh, so this problem hasn't fixed itself, nor has it gotten any better. So we're going to have to go back to, uh, to working on strategies uh, to bring more people into the workforce. Um, and that's... You know, it, everything goes back to that. It's just like when we think about um, the stress on our hospitals uh, during COVID, um, many thought it was all because of COVID, which in reality, uh, the underlying problem was workforce shortages, and they still exist today. Um, has been lifted. What are schools saying if you've been in contact with them? Yeah, I have. Um, I think they're going to uh, welcome the announcement we made today, frankly. I think, um, you know, as much as we messaged prior to the holiday, one of our goals was to foreshadow where we were heading, and it was part of our rationale for announcing uh, the 80% on February 28th. So heading into the holiday, uh, they would not feel more anxious about the other side of the holiday. And of course, then the CDC made its announcement on Friday before Monday school coming back. Um, so it's there's been a lot of interest, more interest now, I think, largely because uh, the broader acknowledgement that the CDC recommendations rec represent that, you know, trends are moving in a positive direction. And um, what what seemed more difficult prior to the holiday is now much more uh, probable, and people are much more interested in that uh, and moving forward very quickly, actually, on mass removal. So. I think, I think the announcement today will be well received. I also should add the incentive uh, for 80%, 85 90% of uh, those who are vaccinated, whether it's a mass mandate or not, still exists. Um, so we still want to promote that. We still feel schools should be actively pursuing that and getting kids vaccinated and take advantage of the uh, financial incentive to do so. All right, we'll move to the phones, starting with Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Where Senate Natural Resources is likely to pass out three bills opposed by many hunters and trappers, including a reorganization of the Fish and Wildlife Board, ban on leg hold traps, and severe restriction on hunting coyotes with dogs. What's your view on these bills? I haven't seen the bill. I've heard uh, that they were, I didn't know it was uh, um, 
on the edge of passing out of the uh, Center of Natural Resources, but uh, but we'll see. We'll see how the debate goes. Uh, this is uh, one one body, the Senate, uh, taking up the bill, and we'll we'll see what they do with it and how it ends up uh, if it gets to the uh, to the House and where it goes from there. Um, we um, again, uh, I don't uh, I don't mind taking a look at some of our. Uh, laws in in that regard and make changes where necessary, but uh, uh, but by and large, I think our our regulations are working. Thank you. Uh, now that Burlington has passed its prostitution repeal, likely that state bill will be getting a, a look a session maybe next. Uh, what's your what's your view on either decriminalizing or regulating I didn't get all of that guy it was uh, it was something about the city of Burlington decriminalization but I didn't get much more than that uh, Burlington has decriminalized has voted to repeal its prostitution charter language how do you feel about a state bill also would decriminalize prostitution or regulate it as an industry? Yeah, I, I don't think that's what Vermont needs at this point. All right, we'll move to Joseph Gresser, Barton Chronicle. Joseph. All right, we'll move to Pete Hirschfeld, VPR. Pete. Okay, we'll try Greg Sakenik, Bennington Banner. Hello, this is Greg Sakenik. Thank you. Um, Governor, um, the charter change for Brattleboro you vetoed on Monday was passed by 68% of Brattleboro voters. How do you square that veto with your past support of local control and other issues? Yeah, I mean, I think this is different um, from my perspective. Um, I don't like to see a patchwork quilt of uh, different initiatives when it comes to voting. And uh, as I said in the veto message, and I'm sure you've read that at this point in time, but when we're having conversations about extending the, uh, the age limit, raise the age, so to speak, of when a um, young adult can be charged in a crime, uh, but at the same time, because they don't have the, um, have, have the, 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 the sense at, at that point in time to make the right decisions uh, that we are now going to allow uh, a younger uh, group to vote. And I just, I don't think that squares. Uh, so if we want to have this conversation on a statewide basis, um, so be it. Um, but, uh, but I don't think it should be done uh, piecemeal. And I felt the same way with other charter changes in the past um, because I, I think it should be consistent throughout Vermont. Uh, thank you. I have one more question, Governor. Uh, last week, Texas Governor Greg Abbott, a fellow Republican, uh, classified gender-affirming medical treatment provided to transgender children as, quote, child abuse, end quote, and asked mandated reporters such as teachers and social workers to report parents who provide that treatment for their kids. What do you think about Governor Abbott's actions, and what would you tell Vermont transgender kids and their parents about how state government intends to treat them now and going forward? I, I would just respond, we aren't Texas. I'm sorry, excuse me, I, I couldn't hear that. Just, just a simple, we aren't Texas or Vermont, okay. and we, we'll, we would treat people differently. Thank you. 
Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Good afternoon. Um, gasoline prices are, are in a lot of places in Vermont at three dollars and ninety nine cents, and a lot of that, of course, is driven by what's happening in Ukraine and the Russian invasion. Have you seen any, or has Commissioner Pichek seen any other impact on the the state economy from what's happening? You know, there's a lot of banking stuff going on and finance and all that. Have, have we seen anything locally? Not that I'm uh, aware of. I mean, the, the big factor, of course, is uh, uh, fuel prices, uh, and that was happening actually before uh, the Ukraine issue uh, came to the surface. So. Um, this is a problem. Inflation is a problem. We've talked about this a lot, and and it um, it is due to many many factors. Uh, the pandemic being one, uh, the amount of money in the economy is another. Uh, labor costs are soaring. I mean, it's just uh, combined. It's just a very volatile period. Uh, but that. But I'm not aware of anything else in regards to Ukraine um, and having an effect on on pricing at this point. Uh, but we'll see how long this goes and, uh, and what, uh, uh, what may um, be the result of this. Uh, I, I would say I was surprised to learn that uh, uh, I think uh, Russia is the 11th highest uh, import-export, uh, the amount of trade that we do uh, with a country, um, Russia's 11th. Uh, some of that is in with tires and uh, and fertilizer, and uh, I can't remember what the other was, but but I was surprised to learn that. So we'll see what um, what the effect is. I had a, a, a reader ask me this question, so I'll ask it to you because I, I don't know. Is um, um, school uh, meals being free for every public student? Bre breakfast and lunch. Yeah, Secretary French. I did. Was there a question with that? I was wondering what the administration's position is on on the, the free breakfast and lunch program for everybody. Yeah, I mean it, it's an interesting policy, and one uh, we're working with the General Assembly to pursue. It is complex. Uh, one of the bigger issues for the Agency of Education is that we use uh, the statistic of eligibility for free and reduced lunch for, as a proxy for poverty, and that touches a lot of our other programs like E-rate and so forth. Uh, which is a reimbursement for bandwidth for schools. So we're interested in working with the General Assembly on that, uh, and that's a policy that's moving forward this session. Um, I'd also mention it also touches on uh, the waiting study uh, analysis that's going on, you know, the, the larger reform of the education funding system, because there's a poverty indicator there as well that's being reviewed in conjunction with the implications on the free and reduced lunch program. So something we're looking at. Uh, but it's complex and has to be con considered in the context of the broader funding system. Okay, thank you very much. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Governor, the, uh, across the country, I'm sure you've seen that uh, one of the fallouts from the banning or, or, or taking off the shelves of certain Russian products <laughs> falls mostly to vodka, and uh, statistics show that the amount of Russian vodka in the entire United States represents about 1.2% of all of the vodka. Meanwhile, people are confused and pouring out uh, Stoli and other ones that are actually not made in Russia. Um, have you uh, considered putting out a list of the specific brands that you're banning in the state for more clarity? It's, it's actually in our executive order. Uh, so we have uh, listed, there's only three brands, I, I believe, that uh, would fall under that category of <laughs> being Soviet, uh, or I mean, Russian owned, um, or an entity um, that's uh, owned by um, someone from Russia. So there's only three uh, at this point in time. Um, I might right. ask. I, I might be able to give them to you. I, I think uh, Commissioner uh, Knight is on the line. Yes, I am, Governor. 
Could you um, could you give us the list? We have communicated with the agency stores. They know specifically which of the products they have in their stores. There's only two of brand two of those brands the governor mentioned. Another brand is available on special order, and we have shared on our social media with consumers as well as the website and the agency portal and with the agency stores that Stoli and Smirnoff are not made in Russia. So is Hammer Hammer and okay, Sickle? Okay, thank you. Uh, I think was one. What was the other pardon? one? Uh, Hammer and Sickle was one. Russian. <clears throat> yes, uh, Green Mark is another. That's right. And Beluga. Yes, that's made uh, by Russian Standard. Russian Standard, right? And Beluga. Um, Governor, the other question I I have is in this you are uh, asking the General Assembly to appropriate six hundred forty three thousand seventy seven dollars for every Vermont, or, as you say, for humanitarian efforts. Do you have a specific target that you would like to see of humanitarian aid where that money would be sent? Well, I'd uh, advocated for the emergency board to take this up, um, which I'm a member of, and the chairs of the money committees are, are also members, and we would, uh, we would look for options to make sure that we made it as effective as possible getting to where the help is really needed. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Aaron Patanko, BT Digger. Hi, um, I have a question about the um, the mask order or uh, sorry, um, the mask recommendation. Um, you know, Dr. Kelso cited the CDC plan and said that it was kind of a wise way of looking at the virus, but. The CDC plan, from what I understand, still places five counties under a high transmission level, which would um, mean that they would still recommend COVID mitigation measures like masking. Do you think that it's safe for those counties to unmask on March 14th? We do. I mean, because we're, we're looking at it differently in Vermont as we have from the start. I know that there was a lot of, uh, of dialogue uh, about trying to distinguish counties, one county from another, and maybe even um, imposing certain measures on counties that had a high level of transmission versus others that didn't. And we resisted that uh, throughout the last couple of years. And uh, we are going to uh, look at this uh, from uh, holistically from um, the entire state of Vermont instead of by county, uh, because we're so intertwined uh, with uh, everyone else. Uh, th there are folks from the rural parts of the state who, who have to drive into um, heavily populated regions uh, that, uh, that work in those areas. We socialize in those areas. We shop in those areas. I mean, it's just we're moving around a lot in Vermont. So I don't, I don't know is the, it would be fair for us here in this state uh, to utilize <coughs> the, uh, the county uh, determination. So we are going to uh, to look at this as a as a entire state, and then we will be uh, yeah. we'll be. Uh, I'll ask Dr. Kelso to elaborate on that as well. We do think it's safe, and my understanding is CDC plans to update those community levels at the county um, at the county level weekly. And given our recent data and our trends in the last few weeks and where we think our trend line is going in Vermont, I'd be very surprised if we continued to see um, counties in the, in the high range, you know, due to, um, you know, a small outbreak somewhere or something or small numbers, we might see some fluctuation back and forth. But overall, I think the trend is all of the counties in Vermont are going in the right direction and at a statewide level it's safe to move forward okay um i also have a question about biden's um test to treat plan i from what i understand this would provide um antiviral therapies and medical therapies for high-risk people at the point of contact like a pharmacy or a healthcare provider is the vermont government playing any role in getting that program set up do you have any details about where it is right now? I don't have any details on that at this point, Aaron. Um, that was a surprise. Uh, for, I, the, it was the first I'd heard of it uh, when the, the president uh, um, said that in his State of the Union. 
So we'll uh, we'll circle around. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Levine isn't uh, here today, but uh, we'll make sure that uh, he connects with you when he can, or we'll find someone who has that information. But I'm not aware of uh, of how that would work uh, in Vermont and what we have to do uh, to partic participate. Um, I mean, would you say that you're generally supportive of the strategy? I think, uh, yeah, somewhat. I mean, as long as it's safe, uh, I think that having um, that, another tool in the toolbox, so to speak, and, and having the ability for individuals to, to get uh, the uh, antiviral uh, treatment that they need in a, such a quick fashion makes, makes sense to me. But uh, I would want a healthcare uh, professional like Dr. Levine and others to to weigh in on this. Uh, they, they obviously will know much more about it than I do. Okay, thank you. Greg Lamoureux, the County Courier. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, I want to just circle back to the uh, gas prices for a, a quick moment. Um, here in Northern Vermont, we're seeing, you know, 60, 70 cent gas increase in 48 to 72 hours. I'm wondering if the state is monitoring, and, and I should I should clarify, it's not consistent from one gas station to another, uh, although it does seem to be consistent from maybe one supplier to another. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if the state is, is monitoring some of this to make sure that there isn't any fraud on the uh, level of, of uh, fuel distributors or um, individual gas stations to, to ensure that it's, it's uh, you know, rising or falling with the, the market, not just uh, fear. Um, a couple of things. I would say uh, the attorney general is probably watching this. Uh, I know in the past uh, they, he has made comments about this. So I'm, I'm, I'm confident that he's watching this situation. But it's not as easy as it might seem either, uh, because it depends on when you receive the fuel and how much fuel you go through or the gas you distribute on a daily basis. Some of the some of the bigger um, stations uh, go through it quicker, uh, so they get a new uh, load of fuel, and it's at the new price. So um, if they they're they're seeing it in in real time, where someone who uh, only goes through maybe one. Um, when um, uh, delivery a month, let's say, um, they they have their price that they're working on uh, from before. So, again, it's it's a little more complicated than what the market says. Uh, it's going up and down. It depends on on when you distribute that that fuel yourself. So, uh, but again, I, I would imagine the attorney general and you you should probably contact him to see what he's thinking. Uh, but um, but I know in the past he's he's commented about this. Thank you. Um, the only other thing I have for you today is uh, on the on the topic of Russian produced uh, uh, vodka or or liquor in general. Um, it, with the way Vermont liquor stores are run, that's actually product that's owned by the state of Vermont, already purchased by the state of Vermont from uh, other distributors. So by by pulling it off the shelf. Uh, you're not really taking money away from Russia or the or the producer in Russia. You're you're taking money away from uh, uh, the state of Vermont Department of Liquor. So I'm wondering, from an inventory point of view, how much money are we talking about, and uh, you know what what happens going forward uh, with that product? Does it does it sit on a shelf in Montpelier somewhere until uh, you know? Russia fixes its act, or is it going to get destroyed, or what are we talking? Uh, a, cu a couple of things. Uh, one is we uh, once we take it out of the warehouse and bring it to uh, the uh, 802 stores, uh, then we own it. Uh, then we have to purchase it. Uh, what's sitting in stock in the warehouse right now uh, is owned by a distributor, so we're not paying for that. So when you look at uh, the the amount and and those when you the hammer and sickle and and uh, green green work Russian yeah Russian standard um, 
we're talking about a total of about $13,000. Um, so we will bring that back and put it in the warehouse and wait this out. Um, but it's only $13,000 at this point. So, so pretty much just a, more of a symbolic thing than, than anything at $13,000? Yeah. yeah. Uh, again, uh, we, I said that uh, during my remarks. This is uh, symbolic symbolism. But, um, but, you know, when everyone does their part and does a little bit, uh, it, in, in the end, it, uh, it really amounts to something. And I think a number of states have done this. Uh, we're doing our part. We're looking for other opportunities as well um, so, that, um, so that Russia, um, President Putin, uh, feels uh, some pain uh, from, from his actions. Okay. Thank you, Governor. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thanks. Nothing from me today. I appreciate the opportunity. And by the way, when we're talking about, uh, thank you, Andrew, uh, when we're talking about uh, vodka in particular, we do uh, have some of the highest quality vodkas from our own distributors, uh, uh, distillers uh, here in Vermont, award winning. So we don't have to worry about what's happening in Russia in terms of vodka. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Ed, I see that you're on, but you're muted. All right, we'll try Gordon, the Rutland Herald. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and we'll be back on Tuesday at our regular time.